This is going to be the most unusual seminar you hear this semester and probably this year and maybe in your graduate student career. The, uh, uh, in 1902, uh, Rudyard Kipling published a delightful series of stories for children. Uh, it, it, these focus on curious animal traits, things like how the leopard got his spots and uh, how the camel got his hump, and of course it would be its hump these days, uh, how the elephant got his trunk and so forth, you know, uh, stories like that. They're uh, delightful stories, but unfortunately, they're very Lamarckian. Uh, the, uh, they're evolutionarily wrong. And uh, uh, not only that, the guy didn't write any <coughs> stories about plants. So I decided, as, uh, as my exit uh, seminars, I'll, uh, uh, a group called the Just So So Stories and which I'm going to focus on curious plant traits, and I'll do it from an evolutionary perspective. If you're here to, uh, if you're here for something with model systems, uh, and, or a great deal of plant physiology, or plant molecular genetics, or molecular biology in general, you may want to leave right now. Uh, uh, so I de-emphasize, at least in, particularly in this story, uh, all of the physiological, genetic, and molecular aspects of these studies. But while you're hearing this, you should fill it in with what you know about the molecular biology of uh, fruit maturation and seed production and things of that sort, uh, flowering. Also, the, the studies I'm going to talk about today uh, predate digital images. And so I don't have a lot of slides of my data and things of that sort. I was able to thumb through my box of slides and convert a few of them. But, uh, and also it predates a personal computer, some of this, these studies. Began in 1974 and continued into the early uh, 90s. Okay, so this one, the first talk is called why plants produce so many flowers and so few fruits. And this is a tree in Ann Arbor, and I'd returned from a departmental softball game and with a couple of other guys, including the guy whose porch is right across the street from this tree. This picture was taken from his porch, uh, Wade Thomas, and he's now the uh, Elizabeth Britton, curator of botany at the New York Botanical Garden. But anyway, we were sitting there and we bought a case of beer on the way home and we were sitting on this, uh, his porch. His wife wouldn't let us in the house because we were filled with dust <coughs> and gray and uh, that red clay, that orange clay that you get on baseball fields, that sort of thing. And as we drank the beer, we started wondering, why does this plant produce so many flowers and so few fruits. And this is the inflorescence of a horse chestnut, the lower flowers open, and then eventually these buds up here will open. But there's 25, 30 flowers open at any given time on this inflorescence. But you know it's only going to make one, two, maybe three fruits per inflorescence. So we started thinking, why? You know, why make all those flowers if you're going to make so few fruits? And we started generating hypotheses and things of that sort and uh, getting excited and each hypothesis was more and more out there uh, <laughs> as, as the uh, afternoon became an evening. And, uh, and, but unlike many things, that I have thought of and wrote down on cocktail napkins. This one still excited me the next day. And I walked into the biological sciences department and I started talking to somebody else about this and he said, yeah, Darwin wondered about that too. So, uh, uh, and in fact, the beginnings of most uh, plant reproductive biology really happened here at Down House in Kent, England. And don't let anybody tell you anything different. 
Darwin was really a plant biologist. He not only published multiple books on plant biology, but he did the one thing that all plant biologists do is he complained about his greenhouse space. <laughs> okay? So you gotta complain about your greenhouse. Now, now we can also complain about growth chambers malfunctioning and things of that sort. So we know Darwin was a botanist. Uh, three books on plant reproductive biology, one on the various contrivances by which British and foreign orchids are fertilized by insects, the different forms of flowers up on plants of the same species, and the effects of self and cross fertilization in the vegetable kingdom. Okay, so, and he referred to plants, including the horse chestnut, as it turns out. He, uh, he concluded that these have profligate and inefficient. He, he just can't, couldn't understand how you could have so many different species that produce a lot of flowers and so few fruits. And so when we're talking about profligate and inefficient, uh, you can look at the milkweeds, which we all know. They produce about 80 flowers for every fruit. Catulpa speciosa, which is a plant that I worked on as a grad student, it produces about 27 flowers for every fruit. You've got yucca plants, 11 flowers to every fruit. Cleome, uh, backyard uh, garden plant that many of you know about. 18 flowers for every fruit. Apples, about 27 flowers for every fruit. And in fact, if you look at this, most plant, you can find examples of this sort of thing in most plant families. All plant families that I know enough species about have this. Uh, you can find them woody and herbaceous, annual and perennial. You find them in temperate, tropical, desert, Mediterranean habitats, a variety of pollination types, things of that sort. So one of the first hypotheses we talked about is, well, maybe those you get so few fruits because the flowers just aren't pollinated. And uh, so uh, I went out, I went over to Wade's house, across, I brought in uh, flowers from trees that I collected in Ann Arbor, and I went by and on several of the inflorescences they were already in bloom, but any flowers they had open at that time, I just outcrossed them all. I hand pollinated them, outcrossed them all. And I uh, uh, went back about two weeks later, and this is what these inflorescences look like. You saw a lot of little fruits developing, and in fact, if you looked on the ground, you saw that they'd already dropped or outsized many fruits. If you did a thumbnail dissection, you know, pulled these things apart, you could see that there were fertilized uh, uh, seeds inside of their embryos. And, uh, and then we ended up with just a few fruits for inflorescence by the end of the summer. So the next plant that I knew that did that sort of thing was Catulpa. Here's Catulpa speciosa in full bloom. There was a nice stand of these along the Huron River at the uh, Botanical Gardens outside of town there. It produces these inflorescences with about 27 flowers per inflorescence. Well, I hand pollinated every one, put bags over these inflorescences, pulled uh, like uh, nylon bags, hand pollinated them, outcrossed them, that sort of thing. I got a bunch of little fruits to initiate development, and only about one fruit per inflorescence developed to maturity. And then there was a little weedy legume, uh, Lotus corniculatus. It uh, also uh, has many flowers. It starts to develop many fruits, but about 60, only about 40 percent of the flowers produce mature fruit. So, so they're of sizing fruits also. So then I said, how many flowers are required for maximum pollination? So I created these single flower inflorescences where I removed all the buds but one. 
and I opened, you know, that flower opened up, and typically I got a fruit. And uh, I made three flower inflorescences, I made five flower inflorescences, I uh, uh, tracked intact, unmanipulated inflorescences, that sort of thing. What I found is a single flower inflorescence produces about <coughs> 0.9 mature fruits per uh, plant. And uh, three flower inflorescences, a little over one uh, fruit, mature fruit, five flowers produce 1.3 mature fruits. Intact inflorescences also produce 1.3 flower uh, fruits per inflorescence. So you have five flowers suffice for maximum fruit production per inflorescence. So really what's happening is resources, nutrients, photosynthate, water, that must be what's limiting reproduction. We're not talking about squirrels coming down and eating these fruits or uh, anything of that sort, which I also checked. Okay, and evidence for resource-limited fruit production comes from all kinds of agricultural studies. For example, with apple trees, uh, with proper cultivation, pruning, fertilizer, irrigation, insect and pathogen protection, uh, you'll produce far more flowers per apple tree and yield will increase, but still you're only getting mature fruit from about three to seven percent of the flowers. You can go the other direction and do resource deprivation studies where you do uh, you grow the plants in competition with other plants for the nutrients. You can do simulated herbivory or natural herbivory studies. And when these occur after flower production, it leads to uh, increased abscission of immature fruits. You can go down from 1.3 fruits per inflorescence, but you can't go up from that. Okay? And uh, here's a little side story. Uh, Catulpa has a hawk moth, uh, uh, the Catulpa sphinx moth, which pollinates the plant at night, but, during the, uh, but it also lays racks of eggs on the undersides of the leaves. These eggs hatch, and the larvae go up to the edge of the leaves, and they start to chew down the leaves. So what happens is if you look at the plant, where there was a raft of eggs deposited, you see a hole in the tree. Because these larvae, as they move from the first to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the fifth instar, keep getting bigger and dispersing to nearby leaves, and they eat a hole in the tree. And you'll find that when they eat a hole in the tree, they, they excise that fruit too, typically. You go down to like 0.2 fruits per inflorescence. Okay. So, uh, but this is the aside. If you look on the, the back sides of Catulpa leaves, they have an extra floral nectaries in the axils of the principal veins. These uh, are visited by ants. And the ants, when they come up to get their sugar cookie, they also look around the leaf and they'll haul off eggs and first in star larvae. Also, the extra floral nectaries are uh, visited by uh, predaceous insects that haul off first and second instar larvae. And the extra floral nectaries are visited by a variety of parasitoids. This particular one, a Pantophase congregatus, lays its eggs inside of the larvae. The eggs hatch, and they eat out the inside of the larvae. And are particularly cruel because they avoid the major organs until these larvae are gone into their fifth instar because they like to keep their meat warm. <laughs> okay? And then the larva dies, the pupae come out through the skin, and each of these will become another parasitoid. Okay? So uh, it's one of these stories where my enemy's enemy is my friend. So plants, the you know, catulpa is attracting these predaceous insects in order to uh, keep the uh, uh, catulpa sphinx moth under control. Okay, 
But here we go. Here's uh, my garden in my backyard. This is my wife, Sue. She's a good gardener. She makes me haul compost around and put it on this garden uh, in the springtime and so on and so forth. And she plants these. And one of the plants she puts in there is Cleome. And her Cleome makes seeds which she collects for the next year and things of that sort. But if you look at this Cleome plant, here you see down here are these mature fruits that are just splitting open down at here. But then it produced about, what, 10, 12 whirls of flowers that didn't produce any fruits. Then you've got a couple whirls that produce fruits. Then it grew another 10 or 12. And if it's producing a whirl here, you can see the little fruits developing here. And probably these flowers up here will not produce fruits. This plant, it is consistently, along with catalpa and horse chestnut and that sort, consistently producing far more flowers than the available resources will allow it to mature. Uh, but also, if you take this plant and there's a drought some summer and you don't water your garden or something, well, the number of uh, whirls of flowers will increase the spacing between these. So it'll produce fewer whirls over the course of uh, fruits over the course of the summer. And then fruit abscission allows plants to match fruit production with the available resources. Okay. So, but it means that what are the functions of these surplus flowers? You could take this catalpa tree and cut it down to three to five flowers per inflorescence, and you could get just as many fruits. You could make just as many babies with only three to five flowers per inflorescence. What's the function of these? So, one thing I wanted to look at, well, maybe they wouldn't attract as many pollinators. Maybe they would be pollen limited if you only have uh, one to three flowers over the, or five flowers on every inflorescence. But if you notice here, Catulpa has a split stigma. When a bee comes in during the day or the hawk moth at night, the stigma and deposits pollen on the stigma, it'll close up. So what I was able to do is mark flowers that, were, that have a split stigma in intact inflorescences and smaller inflorescences and things of that sort that I manipulated and just walk around all day running this trap line from flower to flower to flower that I marked. And I found that pollinator visitation per flower per hour increases from single flower to three flower to five flower to intact inflorescences. Okay, so there is, by clustering these flowers in time and space, plants are increasing the number of pollinators to visit the plants. However, as Darwin informed us, plants are hermaphrodites, and fitness is determined by the number of descendants that, you, that the plant produces through the combined male and female functions, as well as the quality of the offspring. So I published these data. I hypothesized that, that, that most of these flowers are being produced because they're donating pollen to their neighbors. OK. Well, a couple of clever people, Dave Fleller, and uh, Mary, uh, Michigan at the time, a grad student at Michigan followed up on this. And uh, then uh, uh, Mary Wilson from University of Illinois, they, they started working with milkweeds to see if my conjecture was true. And milkweeds are different than many, most plants. Instead of having pollen grains that they shed, they shed their pollen inside of these saddle bags, these pollinia are called. And these are just filled with pollen. And when a bee comes by to visit a flower, it picks up these saddle bags 
carries it to another inflorescence and deposits it onto the stigma in a sort of lock and key sort of mechanism. But the neat part about milkweeds is that they have five pollinia per flower. So they did experiments where they had small inflorescences where they cut off the flower buds. They had large inflorescences. They even had extra uh, large inflorescences where they tied two uh, inflorescences together. And they found out that uh, pollen export, pollinia removed per flower, increases with inflorescence size. So you are, so a plant does export more pollen when it has these surplus flowers. And later studies from my lab and other labs around the country doing paternity analysis where you put out arrays of plants and then manipulate inflorescence size and that sort of thing and then look at who sired the seeds using multi-locus enzyme electrophoresis is what we were doing in the 80, late 80s, and uh, later on microsatellites and things of that sort. And you can show that the more pollinia, the more pollen you export, the more likely you are to sire seeds on neighboring plants. Okay, so when you look at this catalpa tree, or when I look at this catalpa tree, I see something like a peacock, okay? It is big and showy, and most of these flowers are here for the male role. Because siring a seed is cheaper than mothering one. Seed production is limited by resources, but siring a seed production, the mother a seed, You've got to have a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and things of that sort. But to sire a seed, that's limited by access to the ovules. You have to get your pollen out there to neighboring plants. Uh, so all the flowers on this tree uh, attract and reward pollinators. All flowers function as male. And each flower is also capable of gathering pollen onto its stigma. Okay, so then I started asking which fruits mature and which ones of size. Well, here we have the horse chestnut again, and here's the immature fruits. Well, studies that were coming out in the 50s and 60s and early 70s using radioactive labeling of carbon uh, and, pho and photosynthesis and that sort of thing showed that these leaves that are right below the inflorescence they're the ones that are putting, that are feeding the babies right above it, okay? These are the nurse leaves. And also, the leaves become storage organs for nitrogen and phosphorus, plus the uh, translocate, uh, the, uh, plus the movement of water up and mineral nutrients from the soil. So that's how the mineral nutrients get here, some through the foam, some through the xylem, and they come up and feed these plants. But if I go out and I hand pollinate, outcross every flower in an inflorescence, I still only get, you know, one, occasionally two fruits produced, but they tend to be on these lower branches, on the lower part of the inflorescence because the resources are flowing up from the bottom. The, those flowers opened a little earlier. They get first crack at the resources and not much goes up to the top. However, if you look at naturally pollinated inflorescences, you can see that the fruits come from all over. There's a slight tendency for the fruits at the bottom to, uh, to be more likely to mature, but, but they, but there, there's times when the plants are dumping those and keeping the ones further up on an inflorescence. So there are these position effects, but position effects aren't that interesting. So I wanted something where there was no position effect. So I went back to Lotus perniculatus, and you notice here that all of these are, e are equidistant 
from the uh, plumbing system of the plant. Okay? So what I did, here's the way a uh, bird's foot tree foil, Lotus corniculatus. It grows for a little bit and then it produces an inflorescence. It grows for a little bit more, produces another inflorescence. It grows for a little bit more, produces one. So over the course of the growing season, if you have a good growing season, each branch is producing lots of inflorescences. It has indeterminate growth. But what I did is on one inflorescence, I randomly removed half of the fruits. I knew this plant would only mature about 40% of its fruits. So I randomly removed half of them. And then on the next one, I let the plant decide which fruits it wants to mature. Then I randomly removed more. And then I let the plant decide, and so on and so forth, for the whole summer on a variety of different plants. So I had random versus plant uh, abscission. We took the resulting seeds. This is Kevin Fillmore, an undergrad in the lab. This is, uh, I wish I could say this was me. Yeah, but this is actually Craig Atkinson, another undergrad who's working with me. I'm a skinny, ugly guy over here. The, uh, what we found out is that random abscission on the uh, fruits have significantly uh, uh, fewer seeds than natural abscission. So when we counted the seeds in the fruit, the ones that the plant decided ended up having more seeds per fruit. Seeds from natural abscission inflorescences also had a higher percent germination. They grew faster. They produced more flowers and fruits than those produced from random abscission. So somehow, so fruit abscission is non-random with respect to seed number and with respect to offspring vigor. Fruit abscission allows plants to have a degree of control over offspring quality. So uh, why is increased seed number related to offspring vigor? One possibility is inbreeding depression. Most plants have both male and female parts and have the potential to self-pollinate. The progeny produced from self-pollination on most species are less fit than the progeny produced from cross-pollination. And we know that, uh, uh, this is a bit in the weeds for some of you, but we know that self-fertilization decreases heterozygosity by 50%, thereby exposing deleterious recessives to selection and decreasing the contribution of overdominance to fitness. So all all living organisms have some deleterious recessive genes. You have them, I have them, that sort of thing. However, when we go to mate, it's very unlikely that we're mating with anybody that has the same 12, 14 deleterious recessives that you have. Okay? However, when you self-fertilize, you, you, get, you have exactly the same deleterious recessives. And so the offspring are not as vigorous. In fact, many of the offspring will not even survive to become full seeds. Okay. That was something that Darwin first pointed out. He, he didn't know about the genetic mechanism. But he first pointed that out in uh, his book, The Effects of Self and Cross Fertilization in the Vegetable Kingdom. However, in the different forms of flowers on plants of the same species, he said if inbreeding affects vigor and fitness, then it should influence floral inflorescence and floral display traits that affect the propensity to self and cross pollinate. And Darwin, in this book, speculated that plants selectively of sized fruits produced from self-fertilization. So what he so what he thought. So here we have this big plant, and if a bee flies from this flower to that flower, that's a form of self-pollination. It's pollen from the same individual. Or if it flies from this inflorescence to that inflorescence, it's still self-pollination. Okay? And uh, he uh, 
Darwin thought that only fruits from cross-pollinated flowers mature. And so he, pre he predicted that these would be the only three flowers that were cross-pollinated. You know, I wonder why they're always at the bottom of the inflorescence and things of that sort. But there's probably some truth here. Uh, so uh, went back to uh, Lotus corniculatus, and we self-pollinated some inflorescences, out, uh, 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 outcrossed others. Uh, we did mixtures of self and cross on the same plant. They did selectively of size, the uh, ones resulting from self-pollination. And we found that the self-pollinations produce, on average, fewer seeds per fruit. Here you see, uh, this is, uh, there's six seeds in here, uh, but it could be. Here's the first seed. The second one died early in development. Here's the third seed. So I went back got these seeds from this experiment, and I looked at the uh, protein uh, electrophoretic data, looked at multi locus enzyme, using multi locus enzyme electrophoresis, and we found that the seeds from the natural excision have greater heterozygosity than seeds from my random removal. So by non-randomly aborting fruits, you are getting rid of those fruits that were produced from self-fertilization. Uh, so low seed number for fruit is associated at least sometimes with self-fertilization. However, something Darwin hadn't considered. Uh, here you have a bee visiting a campanula flower in this case. And when a bee comes in and deposits pollen onto the stigma, that pollen can come from multiple donors. There could be many different plants in the population that the pollen's deposited onto the stigma. Some of those pollen grains could be cross-pollen from neighboring plants and things of that sort. Some of them self-pollen grains. Sometimes a bee comes in and deposits lots of pollen grains onto the stigma. Here you see pollen grains and then the pollen tubes growing down toward the ovules. Sometimes they do a lot. Sometimes they don't deposit too many pollen grains onto the stigma. But what was coming out then in the uh, mid-1980s is that it was learned that approximately 23,000 different genes are expressed in pollen from germination to fertilization. That is, in order for a pollen grain to germinate, grow down through the stigma, through the style, into the ovary, and achieve fertilization requires the expression of 23,000 different genes, 90% of which are also expressed during the diploid or the, uh, the vegetative part of the life cycle. Okay, so you get this huge overlap in gene expression. So, uh, so this race to the ovules is of great evolutionary significance. From the male perspective, the winners get their genes into the next generation, and the losers do not. Remember, you've got pollen from many donors on there, self-cross, that sort of thing. So you expect traits to evolve in the pollen grains that increase pollen competitive ability, fast growing, things of that sort. Okay. How many have ever seen uh, Woody Allen's All You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex movie? Two? Four? Okay. Well, there's one scene where he's dressed up like a sperm, and there's all these other sperm around him. And they come over the loudspeaker and said, and uh, to get ready, fertilize or die. And uh, that's what happens with uh, pollen grains also. Okay. But from the female perspective, pollen donors are not of equal quality. They differ in vigor, uh, health, their uh, resistance to herbivores, differ in relatedness to the maternal sporophyte. So they, some could be self, some could be cousins, some could be so on and so forth. The, 
genotypes of microgametophytes differ even among those from the same pollen donor because of independent assortment of the genes. And we expect the maternal uh, tissue, the style tissue and ovary tissue, to influence the outcome of this pollen tube race to the ovules. So remember, this poor male has to interact with the mother-in-law for its entire life cycle until the very end. And you can imagine the hurdles she makes these pollen grains go through in order to get to her ovules. You know, they have to prove that all of their pathways work correctly, that they can take in nutrients, that they can metabolize things, and so on and so forth. She's checking out. It's, she could probably make it so you didn't need 23,000 genes to get from the stigma to the ovary. She didn't need to separate her stigma from her ovary by that distance, but she wanted to test out these pollen uh, tubes. Okay, so this is one of these slides that I made a long time ago. Okay, so microgamia, but just substitute pollen tube in here, pollen grain. Okay. The genetic composition of the pollen grain determines pollen tube growth rates. And it leads to non-random fertilization. And I've got a whole bunch of data on that if you're interested in it. I give a talk called Microgametophytes, the Forgotten Generation, uh, coming up in a week or two. The, uh, uh, when few pollen grains are deposited onto the stigma, you get both the fast and the slow growing pollen tubes achieve fertilization. And you get a below average seed number. You get low seed number. When you have intense pollen competition, only the fastest growing pollen tubes achieve fertilization. And you get a full complement of seeds. The correlation in vigor, uh, that's growth rate, of the pollen tube and the vigor of the resulting offspring is due to the expression of numerous genes during both stages of the life cycle. Okay? This generates two predictions. One is that the progeny from large pollen loads are more vigorous and less variable in their performance. Okay. So this enters into the uh, zucchini madness portion of my career. And I started working with a wild cucurbita papo. It's a, a monoecious vine that is, has separate male and female flowers uh, with indeterminate growth. It just grows for the whole growing season. For, uh, there's one flower, either a male flower or female flower per node. It, it aborts or sizes about 50% of its immature fruits in good condition. And it's the wild progenitor of the cultivated squashes. It's completely cross-compatible with the cultivated squashes. So, uh, but the advantage to it is, is that you have, the, you have separate male and female flowers, and there's nothing subtle about reproduction in the squash. It has pollen grains the size of basketballs. It has a big stigmatic surface. Things of that sort. You don't have to do emasculations if you want to make sure you're not accidentally pollinating your flower and things of that sort. You can put cheesecloth bags over these and they don't break off very easily. Uh, so anyway, I started working with swap. And you can see things got out of control in the lab. Yeah. Okay. Well, one of the experiments we did early on is we took, uh, uh, we placed small pollen load on one part of the vine, a large pollen load from another part of the vine. We let the fruits mature. We took the seeds from the small pollen load, germinated, grew them in the greenhouse and in the field, and from the large, put them in the greenhouse in the field. We looked at seed germination, number of male and female flowers, and fruits were monitored. Okay? So what we found in the greenhouse is that the uh, uh, seeds from the large pollen loads germinated faster, they grew faster, uh, and, and they grew faster. Okay. But if we looked 
at the variability, if you look at the variance, we also found that the progeny from the large pollen loads were also less variable than the, in these traits than the progeny from the small pollen loads, consistent with both predictions. Okay, then we did this sort of, we did, uh, we grew these plants in the field. Uh, progeny from large pollen loads germinated significantly faster, produced more male and female flowers, produced more mature fruits, produced fruits with more mature seeds than progeny from the small pollen loads. This is Mauricio Quesada, Takshung Lau, uh, Magnus Johansson, and an undergrad, Chris Bowman, who uh, did, uh, they put in most of the work on this project and all of the thought. But we also took the pollen from those plants growing in the field, and we did in vitro germination. And we found out that the pollen from plants produced from large pollen loads grew faster in vitro, and we did this across a, uh, in two years. The second year, we only did 20 minutes of growth versus 30 minutes of growth in year one. But anyway, uh, so uh, the progeny from large pollen loads produce faster growing pollen tubes in vitro. Then we asked, does in vitro also parallel in vivo performance of the pollen tubes? So we did a bunch of controlled pollinations in which we took, we made 50-50 mixtures of pollen from an inbred line of zucchini and pollen from uh, the, the wild squash uh, that had been produced from large pollen loads. And we did this on the zucchini recipients. When we did that, 56% of the seeds were sired by the wild boar. When we made the similar pollen mixture experiment, where we made 50-50 mixture of the tester line and uh, pollen from the plants produced from small pollen loads, only 48% of the seeds were sired by wild boar. And we had like 3,000 seeds in the score. So from uh, 30 different fruits or 40, something like that. So, okay. So then finally, do wild gourds selectively of size fruits with respect to seed number? So what we did is we went out and we had some vines where we pollinated every flower with a small pollen load. Some vines where we pollinated every flower with a large pollen load. Some were only a medium pollen load. And then there was a fourth group where we alternated small, medium, large, small, medium, large. We did them in different orders uh, on the plants. But uh, so, uh, and here's what we got. When you vary the pollen loads between vines, that is, all flowers got this is low for low pollen content. Uh, we got 39 seeds per fruit with the small pollen loads, 56 with the medium pollen loads, 270 with large pollen loads. And then, but when we buried them within the plant, we got 1377 and 289. Uh, so basically our pollen loads translated into differences in seed number. The small and medium had no pollen competition. So here's when we buried the pollen loads between plants. The ones that had the small pollen loads produced 208 flowers, uh, 105 of which matured, 103 of which didn't uh, abort it. So, uh, so we had 50% abscission here. On mediums, we had 50% abscission. And on the large pollen loads, we had 50% abscission. No difference when all the flowers get the same size pollen load on a plant. However, down here where we vary the pollen load within plants, on the small pollen loads, 82% of those fruits have size. 72% of the medium ones have size, and only 29% of the large pollen load fruits have size. So they did non-randomly have size fruits based on seed number. So plants have only limited influence over who they can mate with. These bees come in, 
They've been visiting flowers in the population. Sometimes they've been visiting flowers on the same plant, sometimes other plants, so on and so forth. Plants can't control who they mate with. Okay. However, excising fruits on the basis of, uh, uh, should be seed number, uh, provides some degree of control over the quality of the progeny they produce. They produce fewer inbred progeny, and they produce progeny from intense pollen competition. Okay, well what's the cost of upsizing these fruits? Well here, I'm all fruits except stone fruits. Uh, you know, like cherries and plums and things. All fruits have this sigmoidal growth curve, uh, where if you have some measure of size or it could be uh, a total carbon up here or something of that sort, and time across this axis, you always get the sigmoidal growth curve. And in all fruits, the same three things happen during A, B, and C. In A, the embryos undergo rapid cell division. There's almost no increase in the size. There's just a production of a lot more cells. In B, the pericarp, that is the fruit part, like the edible part of an apple, enlarges. Okay, so all the resources are going into the pericarp. And in C, the seeds fill. That's when the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium goes into these fruits. And that's what limits reproduction mostly. If you want your plants to grow better, you dump some fertilizer that has N, P, and K on onto your plants. Okay. Fruit abscission occurs right in this area, right here. So they've allowed the uh, embryos to uh, reveal any genetic abnormalities or anything of that sort already, right after that occurs. Okay. So we can say, what's the cost of not abscising fruits? Well, you get packaging costs. If you have an apple with two seeds, the cost of the package per seed is a lot greater than the cost if you have eight seeds in that apple. Okay, so there's packaging costs that you save by sizing fruits. Also, if you underinvest NPK in your best offspring, if seed production is not matched with the uh, available resources. So if you don't cut back on these fruits, you're dividing your limited N, P, and K among too many progeny and nobody's getting enough. You would also leave fewer descendants by underinvesting in the male or the cheaper function. And you would produce, on average, lower quality offspring. So, why do plants produce so many flowers and so few fruits? Well, they attract and reward pollinators. By clustering their flowers in time and space, they suck up pollinators from all across the habitat. They export more pollen to their neighboring plants. You would see a bee with a bag of pollen on its leg. They improve the quality of their offspring by excising fruits on the basis of seed number. And they do it at a cost that the average plant can afford. So here's my acknowledgments. Uh, Jim Windsor, a longtime collaborator at the Altoona campus. Winds and I overlapped in grad school, became friends. When he got the job at the Altoona campus, we had grants together for 20 years. A uh, couple of postdocs, uh, Carl Schlechting, uh, Gary Kropnick, uh, graduate students, uh, Bernie Devlin, Os Oscar Rocha, Takshan Lau, Mauricio Quesada, Bonnie Johansson, Lynette Davis, Herman Aviva, and here are the undergrads that have co-authored papers yeah, of the papers in this area. So uh, these are the undergrads here. And of course, I was supported mostly by NSF, but sometimes by USDA. This is Oscar Rocha down here. This is a couple of the undergrads working. I can't remember who they are, but they can't see their faces. But this is my wife, Sue, who also was very involved with a lot of my projects. Whenever I needed cheap labor, she was there and uh, very confident. So, uh, and here's Sue and Wins. This is Jim Windsor and Sue 
uh, uh, you know, be on site too. So uh, Mauricio Quesada, Tox John Magnus, and Chris the Bowman who are published. So, ah, uh, oh no, I did put it down. Okay. So, thank you. If you're interested in attending any more of these, uh, here's the schedule. Uh, some of them are be a little more science than this one. But uh, this was a, a just so story. Just so, so story. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. What about grasses? Uh, I've never worked with grasses. <laughs> to my knowledge, no one has ever done these studies with grasses, and I don't know what proportion of flowers produce seeds in grasses. But I do know there are some wind-pollinated things that also have size fruits. They tend to have, uh, they don't have the extremely skewed sex ratio uh, because uh, you don't have to attract pollinators. Uh, you get down a different number, but I don't know anything about this. Yeah? Same preferences you have in food about in diet species? Do the same arguments hold in dioecious? In dioecious, in fact, I did this study looking at dioecious, monoecious, and flower and fruit ratio. Dioecious species also of size fruits. But you don't find these uh, 27 to 1 ratios and things of that sort because they're not exporting pollen. You take away the male function, uh, you still have some pollinator attraction functions, that sort of thing, the, you know, in terms of these extra values you get by having the flowers. And you get some selective abscission too, based on uh, seed number and things of that sort. There have been a couple of plants. That uh, dioecious plants that's been studied. So the, the, you're talking about how selling uh, is bad if you have injury and depression. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we think that at some level they shouldn't produce too many flowers because they want the pollinator to eat the plant and spread the pollen. Right? Yeah, that's, you, whenever you're producing lots of flowers, you're getting more transfer within the plant. And that's a, uh, uh, the, the advantages, there's also advantages to clustering your flowers in time and space because uh, seed predators, all of your fruits are going through the same thing. So weevils and that sort of thing that go in and eat your seeds, you satiate them. So there's a lot of other factors that play, but you're exactly right. The more flowers you have, the more likely you are to get Probably movement within an, in, uh, within an individual. So you can imagine sort of balancing selection for some of the other Yeah. I've, other like yeah. I found with catalpa trees that almost all of the outcrossing occurs, all of these plants, and there's tremendous synchrony among plants in the population, that it, from the first flower to the last flower is about 10 days. And almost all the outcrossing occurs during the first three days or during the last three days. During the peak time, they suck up pollinators from all over. These trees are just loaded with pollinators. However, the bees come back it, when the flower number is dropping off. They visit a few flowers and go to another catalpa plant. So you, you tend to get outcrossing at the beginning and at the end, and not so much in the middle, during the peak of flowering. What do you know about uh, when you have limited nutrient uh, resource and the fact that the rate of nutrient position? The uh, limited uh, resources during, uh, uh, once the flower buds are produced, yeah. it, uh, if you have herbivory competition, that's or, or even drought, you can greatly decrease the proportion of flowers that produce mature fruits. So you, uh, uh, so sometimes you can have 
tremendous flower production and almost no fruits if you get a pronounced drought or something of that sort afterwards. Okay, thanks.